when our grandson was about two, my husband sneezed, and Grady piped up, bless you, granddaddy. Now, I was kind of surprised. He and his parents lived with us at the time, so I knew that we'd all been coaching him on the basics, like please and thank you, but none of us had worked with him on bless you. So how did he know to say that? Well, obviously, it was by being immersed in our family, where we always say, bless you, when someone sneezes. No one had to teach him. It was just part of the water he was swimming in. We learn most of our language, most of our ethics, most of our patterns of relating, not by reading it in a book or sitting at a desk while a teacher writes on the board, but by osmosis, soaking in the language, the ethics, the relational patterns of the village of people around us. It's all the stuff we're noticing every day without even being conscious of the fact that we're noticing, including what people talk about or don't talk about, how they treat one another, the stories they tell, and how and when they tell them like the story of Ruth. Nicole made reference in last week's sermon to the Bible being a library of books. One of the things you might notice is how that library is organized, because even the order of the books can convey an implicit message. Right before Ruth, for example, is the book of Judges, which is full of conquest and violence and betrayal on a grand scale. And right after the book of Ruth comes 1 Samuel, which gives us the rise of kings and kingdoms and armies and all the political maneuverings that it takes to remain in power. But tucked right into the middle of all the grand scale ambitions and high stakes power plays, there's the little book of Ruth, a four chapter long book about two poor widowed women and the village where they go for refuge. It's not about empire building. It's just a small story of friendship and compassion and integrity in which everyone simply does the decent thing. Imagine that. And, spoiler alert, it even has a happy ending, a true rarity in the stretch of the Bible that this book inhabits. It's a rarity and a gift for our weary spirits. It's also a gift that keeps on giving, because more than all the other seemingly more significant stories told all around it, it is the actions of these two insignificant women and their obscure village that will continue to ripple and ripple and ripple well beyond their time to bring hope and healing to a broken world. But enough preamble. You heard the beginning of the story last week with Ruth's simple act of friendship and courage when she refused to leave the mother-in-law she loved even though it meant going with her to a strange land where she would be a foreigner. Now they've arrived, with nothing but the clothes on their backs. And Ruth, like anyone who moves to a new school or a different town, has to learn what the norms are in this particular village. First, though, she has to figure out a way for her and Naomi to survive. So she decides to go and glean. It was the custom that the poor should be allowed to glean around the edges of a field. They could also go into the fields once the reapers had passed through to gather up whatever grain they might have missed. Ruth's a foreigner, but she's obviously aware of this custom. What she doesn't seem quite sure of is how uniformly the people of this village actually practice that custom. Will she be welcomed, or will she be turned away, or even abused? 
by luck or by providence, she finds herself at the field of Boaz, who just happens to be a close relative of Naomi's late husband. But before we focus on Ruth's relationship to Boaz, Hebrew scholar Dr. Will Gaffney points out that there is a lot going on in Boaz's field in terms of gender, class, and identity. The writer of Ruth wants us to notice these things as well. First, there's the relationship between Boaz and his workers, a relationship with a power differential, which the writer signals by referring to the workers as boys and girls, even though they were almost certainly adults. But at the same time, there's also obvious cordiality and respect between the laborers and their employer. They greet one another with blessings, an exchange that wasn't really crucial to the story, but which the author was careful to include. We can assume that Ruth is taking all of this in and trying to figure out the dynamics. When Ruth thanks Boaz for his generosity, she refers to herself as a slave woman, noting that she isn't even one of his slave women for him to be so kind to her. But in the whole book, Ruth is the only one to use the language of slavery. Now, we know that slavery was a part of ancient Israelite culture. This was no utopia we're talking about. But that's apparently not the situation in this case. It may be that this is Ruth's first encounter with another form of labor. There's also a bit more fluidity in gender roles than we or Ruth might have expected. Now, obviously, harassment and assault of women was common enough that Boaz made a point of warning his male workers not to bother Ruth. But on the other hand, so was decent, common behavior, considering that those workers had been treating her kindly even before Boaz turned up. And when Boaz invites Ruth to drink water whenever she's thirsty, it's water that was drawn by the men, in spite of what's usually being, been considered women's work. So bad behavior happened, but it wasn't normative. And there was some flexibility about who gets the job done. These are some of the village values that Ruth is encountering as a newcomer and a woman, and that we, the reader, are taking in from the story without them ever being pointed out explicitly by the writer. But more than anything else, what we're taking in is that goodness begets goodness. Ruth is good to Naomi. Boaz hears about her actions and responds by showering Ruth with goodness beyond norm, so much grain and so much food that she's able to show even more goodness to Naomi by taking her the leftovers of the meal. And Naomi, as we will see next week, will come up with a plan that will send goodness and happiness back to Boaz and Ruth and eventually herself. All of this, Ruth is learning. All of this we are learning, that goodness and decency are the expected norms of this village, and that what goes around grows around. Well, today is Rally Day, the official start of our program year. Next week, our Sunday school classes will begin for the fall. But we, too, are a village a gathering of families and individuals sharing life together. Classes or no classes, we are always learning from our village. As we work together to serve our community, as we raise children together, as we meet and study together, as we pray together, as we care for one another when we're sick or grieving, as we commend one another into God's care after death, as we welcome newcomers and foreigners like Ruth. 
and all the while we're learning our village norms and we're shaping one another's behaviors as we observe how the members of our village talk to each other and about each other, who gets listened to, how we respond to one another in times of need. We're learning and shaping the values of our children by how we treat them, by the images that we have around us, by the things we're willing to talk about and the things we're not, by how we fight when we disagree and how we show forgiveness, by whether we show appreciation for each person's contributions to our life together or take each other for granted, and by the ways we accept differences or don't. What we teach in a sermon or in a Sunday school class is our explicit curriculum. But what we teach in our actions is what educators call our implicit curriculum. It may seem like small potatoes that won't make a difference in the larger scheme of things, yet there's nothing that matters more. Our relational practices will shape our children's faith and character way more than any Sunday school class. And their faith and character will go on to shape the lives they touch in ways much more profound than the actions of those in places of political power or corporate influence. Because goodness begets goodness begets goodness. And the world desperately needs more goodness. As environmental scientist David Orr writes, the plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places it needs people of moral courage willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. In other words, it needs more people like those we encounter in the Book of Ruth. And that's what we're about. In the midst of what can be a cruel world, we're about creating a village that shapes us and our children into people of decency and kindness and goodness. Because there is no greater blessing for us, for them, or for this world. Thanks be to God.